Hey there, my friend. Welcome to Feast at Home or wherever you're joining us from. Um, for you, it could be Feast at the Car, Feast at, kit at the Kitchen, Feast at the Office, or maybe even Feast at the CR, okay? So wherever or whenever you're joining us from, it is good to have you here. Especially if it's your first time here. I mean, great to have you. I mean, I'm believing that this message will give you clarity on who God is and expand your vision for what He can do for you and through you. Yes? If you believe that today, why don't you type it out on chat? I believe. I believe. Today, I want to start with, uh, I want to start this message with this question. When you read the Bible for the first time, where did you start? Or what was the first book from the Bible that you read, right? Um, some of you probably started with the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. And that's good because the Gospels are about Jesus. However, there are probably some of you who, who started with Genesis just because it's the first book in the Bible. It's at the very start of that big book. So maybe you started reading maybe a few chapters, but at some point, Things got confusing, got complicated, maybe even got convoluted, and maybe you stopped reading. And I don't blame you. I don't blame you. I mean, let's face it. The Old Testament is difficult to understand. I mean, the Old Testament that starts with Genesis is a challenge to understand, especially with its violent parts. I mean, the stories of murder and massacres. I think there were even, you could say, R-rated or X-rated parts where you had stories of incest and rape. I mean, think about it. Why would Abraham okay, um, have a wife named Sarah and then have a baby with her servant, Hagar, plus another wife named Keturah? Maybe you didn't know that, right? Um, so isn't Abraham supposed to be a holy dude? And did you know, did you know this, that King David had eight wives? Thankfully, it's not as bad as his, it's not as bad as his son, King Solomon, who had, guess what? 300 wives and 700 concubines. So, my friend, the next time you think that the Bible is boring, think again. Because I think the Bible can definitely match up with the current juicy K-drama scandals you see or you read online these days, right? But anyway, <laughs> maybe you've also wondered, maybe you've also wondered as you've been reading the Bible, is the God of the Old Testament different from the God in the New Testament. Because the first one seems cruel and punitive, but Jesus is so merciful. Now, of course, there's a lengthy theological answer to that question, but somehow to encapsulate it, and for the purpose of this message, the answer is this. The God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament are the same, okay? The God of the OT and the NT is merciful we just don't know how to be able to understand the bible to be able to see that truth clearly and that's why that's why many christians want to forget the old testament they want to throw it out the window i mean they want to forget the first three-fourths of the bible and just simply focus on the new testament the last one-fourth section of the bible but remember it was bishop robert Barron who said if you don't know israel you don't know jesus in other, words, um, in other words, you wouldn't be able to fully understand the New Testament if you don't understand the Old Testament. Why? Well, first, because Jesus was a Jew. Right? That was his lineage. That was his background. That was his life. Okay? And second, the Bible that Jesus read in his day, which we now know today as the Old Testament, okay? Um, that was his Bible, and, and he loved it, right? So we, in order for us to really fully understand and see the beauty and the glory and the truth of Jesus, we, not, we need to be able to understand and appreciate as well the Old Testament, right? Let me give you an analogy for this. Let me give you an analogy, right? Recently, my brother-in-law and feast builder of Feast Bikutan, Brother Velden Lim, had an MCU marathon, all right, a Marvel Cinematic Universe marathon, 
Okay? And they just did it recently. I think they watched all the 21 Marvel movies um, thus far from Iron Man 1 to Avengers Endgame. And they did it, I think, within a month. And they loved it. They loved it. Um, I remember Velden telling, to, telling me, saying something like, Napanood ko naman yung mga iba uh, dati, pa isa isa. Pero hindi lahat. And not in the right sequence. Pero ngayon na napanood ko na lahat, each and every one, and in the right sequence, nakita ko, na, na, nakikita ko talaga, or makikita mo talaga yung, kung ganun kaganda yung build-up ng storya. And, and I agree. I agree. It, it was amazing because each of the 21 movies was part of one gigantic story. But here's the thing. I bet you, all right? I bet if you just watch the last movie, Avengers Endgame, without watching the first 21 movies before that, um, I'm sure you'd still enjoy it. I mean, and somehow kind of get the story, but I'm also sure you wouldn't understand a huge chunk of the story, the huge chunk of the movie. I mean, like how Thor went from hunk to dad bod, <laughs> right? Now, in the same way, right, here goes the analogy. In the same way, you can say that the New Testament is the last movie of the Bible. And the Old Testament is the long build-up to that, right? And for one to fully grasp the beauty and the triumph of the New Testament, one has to appreciate and understand the long road getting to that beauty and triumph as seen in the Old Testament. For example, our passage today in the Gospel of Matthew is about the Mashiach, all right? The Mashiach, and that's how they say it, with a ch, okay? The Mashiach or the Messiah, okay? And to unlock its full meaning, we need to understand what Mashiach means in the Old Testament, okay? See, the Mashiach is not just one of those nice topics that was touched on in the Old Testament. I mean, if the Old Testament was a TV series reference to the Mashiach, okay, wasn't just a cameo appearance for one episode or for one season. I mean, the Messiah or the Mashiach is the entire plot line of the Hebrew Bible, the Hebrew Scriptures, the Old Testament. I mean, the whole Old Testament is an elaborate setup to the coming of the Mashiach, the, the Messiah. In fact, um, the Bible's entire plot, right, if we would just encapsulate it and summarize it in one statement would be this. That God created us in His image. Um, he, God created us in His image, but we did a horrible job as His representatives. So God promised He'll send the perfect image, the Mashiach, who will restore us as His image bearers. All right? So that's one way to somehow be able to see the entire storyline of, of the Bible. That everything, every single thing, okay, points to the Messiah. And it all started right from the very beginning, right from the very beginning in Genesis. When, when Adam and Eve fell, God already told the serpent. Right? And this is found in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. It says there, And I will cause hostility between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He will strike your head and you will strike his heel. Right? So every time God uses a special guy in the Bible, people got excited, right? got their hopes up, got their expectations up that it could be the Messiah, the Mashiach. So the first Messiah guy, if you want to to use that term. I mean, the first Messiah guy was Noah, right? And people were thinking, will he be the Messiah? Well, sadly, right after the flood, he, he failed, right? Um, will it be Abraham? I mean, surely it could be him. I mean, he was the father of many nations. But alas, he turned out to be a liar and a coward. Perhaps it could be Jacob. I mean, whose name was Israel. I mean, they named the country after him, after all, right? Is he the one? But sadly, he was a deceiver from day one, okay? Um, maybe you could say it would be Moses, right? But he wasn't even worthy to enter the promised land. I mean, surely it could be the great King David, the greatest king of all Israel, of, of Israel. But 
you know, his story, he, he was an adulterer and a murderer. I mean, I could go on and on and on all the way to the very end of the Old Testament. Guy after guy um, who people thought would be the Mashiach. But then, Jesus appeared on the scene and he was the Mashiach, the Savior they've never seen before. And this leads us um, actually to our main passage today as we continue our journey through the Gospel of Matthew. So that was like a set up, a build up to our main message today. So please take your Bible, turn with me to Matthew chapter 22. Matthew chapter 22, verses 41 to 46. All right? So if you're there, just hold on to that. We'll get there in a bit. Okay? So. Today, we continue this heated discussion between the Jewish religious leaders and Jesus. And up until this point, they've been bombarding Jesus with controversial questions left and right to question his authority and identity. And they had a plot to also discredit him and somehow lead him to his death. Now, if you remember, the first one was about paying taxes. The second one was about resurrection. And the third one was about um, which one or which uh, one was the most important commandment. However, in spite of being barraged by these loaded, tricky questions, Jesus um, was able to respond to each one brilliantly, actually, brilliantly affirming his authority and identity and also escaping their evil ploy um, with his wit and wisdom. I mean, each attempt backfired to, to the religious leaders. Now, this time around, okay, on this occasion of where we're about to read, okay, Jesus now turns the table. Okay? Now, he's the one asking the question. He now questions the questioners. Okay? He, he brings this question to the table for their careful, careful consideration. Jesus does this. Um, uh, not to show them that he is smarter, not uh, he doesn't need to because his responses to the previous questions already attest to his genius, right? Um, he raises these questions not to, to Bible bash them either or, or to somehow seek revenge by using the word as a weapon as some people do. But Jesus puts this question for discussion to help the Pharisees see something about the Messiah that they weren't seeing. See, Jesus wanted to elevate their understanding of who he truly is. So, um, if you watch courtroom dramas, I liken this scene that we're about to read um, like those courtroom dramas where after the lawyer for the opposition exhausts all his questions, suddenly the lawyer of the defense confidently stands up and is now the one asking the question to the witnesses as he paces the floor slowly. And his questions, it's, it's, it's a pivotal moment, right? It's a climactic moment to the whole movie, to the whole courtroom scene. His questions are about to reveal something crucial to the case. So that's just how I'm imagining um, this scene, okay? Just to give some flavor and spice to, to reading God's word. But anyway, here's the question that Jesus asks. In verse 41, right? Then surrounded by the Pharisees, Jesus asked them a question. What do you think about the Messiah? Whose son is he? All right? Whose son is he? You know, have you ever been asked a question that the answer for many is so basic or simple, but you yourself didn't know it. Give, let me give an example, honest confession. I, growing up, I didn't know what was kaliwa at kanan. Um, I couldn't tell. I could tell left from right, but I didn't know its Filipino counterpart. And sadly, I was that bad in Filipino. I think, honestly, I, I, I only learned the difference of Kaliwa at Kanan um, when I was already in high school. 
And how did I learn it? Because my cousin taught me, he said, Kaliwa has the letter L. <laughs> so that means left. And when I heard that, it's like, um, it's like my whole world lit up with a hallelujah, with a hallelujah sound effect, okay? Because I finally got it, okay? So in this scene, and what does that have to do with this? Okay, to the Pharisees, the answer to Jesus' question was a no-brainer. It was a basic, simple question that they knew. It was like an elementary level question. It's like my Kaliwat Kanan. It was an elementary level question for them. And it was easy, so easy, very easy for them to answer. So they gave Jesus a textbook answer. Right? They replied this. They replied, He is the son of of David. Now, who is David? Do you remember? Right? David was the sling shooting, uh, the sling and stone shooting kid that brought down Goliath, right? Um, David was the greatest king of Israel. He, he brought them from, uh, he brought them military success and established their nation, giving them peace and prosperity for many years. Uh, David was known of course, to be after God's own heart. He was one of the authors of the book of Psalms. He, he was a national hero to them. He was their ideal leader. And not only David, and not only was David, rather, not only was David a great hero and leader to the nation of Israel, but he also received a great promise from Yahweh, from the Lord, from God. According to um, several parts of the Hebrew scriptures, like in the second book of Samuel, chapter 7, it was revealed by Yahweh that David's lineage of kings, right, that through David's lineage of kings, a savior king um, would come who will rule and reign forever. Thus, if you think about it, if you look at it, um, the response of the Pharisees was correct. I mean, they nailed the question. They got it right. Well, partially, actually. <laughs> And you might wonder, why partial? Well, in their mind, they were expecting a Messiah king like David who would kick out the Romans and make Israel a superpower again. Right? That's why Jesus asked them another question. Right? So they got it. They got it. They said, um, the, the, they said that the Messiah would be David's son. So they got it. But again, it wasn't the full answer. It was a partial answer. And that's why Jesus asked them another question in verse 43. Okay. Jesus responded, Then why does David, speaking under the inspiration of the Spirit, call the Messiah my Lord? For David said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit in the place of honor at my right hand, until I humble your enemies beneath your feet. So, to strengthen the limit, le, oh, sorry, <laughs> to strengthen the legitimacy of his question, Jesus here quotes from Psalm 110, verse 1. Okay? That was the psalm that was, that was there. Okay? But its English translation could be a little confusing because it seems like David is talking or writing in the third person and mentions the term Lord twice, right? So it, it begs the question, who is he talking to, all right? Or, or, or the question, is the Lord here one and the same person, okay? You see, in the Hebrew language, there is a distinction between the first and the second Lord. So the English translation is very confusing because it's both Lord. But if you look at the Hebrew language um, from which it was really written, you will see that there is a difference, all right, between the first and the second Lord. Because the first Lord is translated Yahweh, the divine name of God, uh, the, of the God of Israel. The second Lord is translated Adonai, which means superior king or, or master. So here in this psalm, uh, David is reflecting on Yahweh's covenant with him, particularly the promise that from his dynasty of kings would come a great ruler, the Messiah King, who would free Israel from all its captors. So with that clarified, okay, with that clarified, 
This was Jesus' question in, in simpler terms, okay? If the Messiah is the human descendant of David, how come David calls him Lord? Or in other words, if the Messiah is David's son, then why does David imply that this guy is greater than him? Being the father, the patriarch of his family. We see, we see this in verse 45, where, where Jesus asked the same question. Since David called the Messiah my Lord, how can the Messiah be his son? Right? How can the Messiah be his son? In other words, how can the latter be greater than the former? How can the son be greater than the father? You see, a first century Jew right, might call his father Lord, but a Jewish father would not address his son as Lord. He would not address his son this way. Thus, David reveals that his son, that this son, that this, this son that he's speaking of in this passage, in the Psalms that Jesus quotes, okay, David reveals that his son is no mere man and therefore calls him Lord, Adonai, for he is greater than himself. In other words, the, the Messiah will be greater than David. I, I hope you're, you're tracking along with me and you're getting this. See, Jesus was pointing out to the Pharisees that the promised Messiah, the Savior King, is not a military political leader who will overthrow their Roman captors, but a divine ruler who will establish his kingdom on earth. So son of David is really not an adequate title or representation of this Messiah that, they're, that Jesus is talking about. Right? But rather the title, Son of God. Right? Son of God. So after Jesus somehow dropped this truth bomb, okay, it, it was like a mic drop moment. Right? It was like a mic drop moment in, in verse 46. Let me read it to you. It says there, where are we? Here. It says there, No one could answer him, and after that, no one dared to ask him any more questions. Mic drop moment. The mic drop moment of Jesus. So Jesus, through these two simple questions, two simple questions, exposed the Pharisees' shallow and narrow understanding of the Messiah, of who the Messiah is. I mean, they were so fixated on what they wanted the Messiah to be and what they expected the Messiah to be. But they were so fixated with that that they couldn't even see the Messiah looking at them right straight in their eyes at that very moment, right? The Pharisees and the Sadducees didn't see Jesus as the Messiah because to them, he didn't fit their needs. He didn't fit their list of expectations. I mean, Jesus was really a zillion times more than what they wanted him to be, than what they expected him to be. I mean, he exceeded that, beyond that, above and beyond that. He, he is both fully God and fully man. Jesus is the Messiah King who is building a kingdom throughout all the earth. But the Jewish leaders were fixated, were just fixated on a tiny patch of land in the Middle East that's even, I think, one-fifth the size of Luzon. So their idea of the Messiah, actually, was selfish, self-serving, and small compared to God's agenda. Now, with that, before I close this message, allow me just to, um, allow me just to encourage you around our giving. Because one way that you and I can take part in this, in Jesus' kingdom building enterprise is through giving. For through our giving, the sharing, uh, the sharing of our resources, our generosity, the kingdom of God advances. And people um, are reached with the love and the life-transforming message of Jesus. So 
unlike the Pharisees who were just concerned for their own needs and their own agenda, I want to encourage you, let's look beyond our own needs and our own agendas and give generously to the continuous expansion of God's kingdom here on earth. So that, so that the face of the earth and the lives of its people would be renewed in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So here are the different ways that you can give online. And for that, let me just thank you in advance for your continued support and generosity. Now, to close this message, let me ask you. My friend, maybe just like the religious leaders of Jesus' day, you feel like He doesn't fit your need. Maybe you have a failed expectation of God or maybe an unanswered prayer. Maybe you wanted Him to move in a certain way in your life, but it didn't happen. Maybe, maybe it seems to you that God doesn't even care. But the truth is, He sees and knows your need. I mean, are you in pain right now? God feels your pain. Are you carrying a burden right now? Truth is, God carries that burden with you. Why do I know? Because Jesus, the Mashiach, experienced your pain on earth. I mean, this is the mystery of the incarnation. That again, He was fully God and fully man. And that means He tasted the same temptations, He cried the same tears, and He experienced the same pain. And He doesn't want you to stay in that pain. He doesn't want you to stay in your pain. Let me read this to you in Hebrews um, chapter 4, verse 15 to 16. It says there, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weakness, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are. Yet He did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. My friend, God knows your need and God will meet your need and even exceed it, but sometimes not in the way that you expect it. Say that again. God knows your need and God will meet your need and may even exceed it, but sometimes not in the way that you expect it. Because His plans are bigger than your problems. My friend, God feels your pain, but His plans for you are bigger than your problems. I mean, not that He doesn't care for your problems, In fact, as your Mashiach, your Messiah, your Savior, He wants to save you from your problems. But He also wants you to be His saving grace to His people. He wants you to be His embrace to the hurting. He wants you to be nourishment for the hungry. He wants you to be healing for the heartbroken. I remember this friend of mine. Let's let's call him John. See, John... um, fell into substance abuse early on in his life. When he was 11 years old, he he started smoking cigarettes. By 13, he was taking marijuana and drinking alcohol. By 17, he got into, I think, harder drugs like shabu, cocaine, and LSD. At age 23, he was also already involved in in the underworld, and most of his contacts were, were dirty policemen. I mean, he... He got into dealing drugs and firearms as a way to somehow be able to make money and sustain his habit, his his addiction. Um, When he was 32 years old, he was put into into a rehab facility for six months only to relapse two weeks after he got out. And it was only in 2009 that he found his way to the 12-step program of Narcotics Anonymous. And... Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, This was when he he finally realized that that he was sick. 
and he was sick and tired for being sick and tired. It was also there that he 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 met the Lord and, and his love which began to change him, which began his transformation. Eventually at some point he, he surrendered himself to the Lord, turning his will and his life over to God's care. Um, as the Lord continued his healing, the Lord gave him a calling. Um, John found out that a way to keep himself sober was to keep paying his recovery forward by helping newcomers to the 12-step program and sharing with them his journey of recovery and hope. Uh, shortly after, he, he studied in Sefam, the Center for Family Ministries, to, and he did this to, to equip himself to counsel and help suffering addict, addicts and alcoholics. So, he realized that in ministering to them, he discovered a greater purpose to his sobriety. That, that God healed him not just to set himself, no, sorry, sorry, that God healed him not just to set him free, but to use him to set others free as well. He, he discovered that entirely new purpose to his living, to his sobriety. And by God's grace, he and his wife also found their way to our feast, where their marriage is being strengthened and they're able to serve the Lord together. Today, um, God continues to use John to help addicts in their recovery journey. And he says, life is not perfect, but as long as I live in God's image and likeness, I know it's a path that will always lead me. My friend, whatever need you have, whatever pain you're feeling, whatever problem you're going through, let me just tell you, God is not finished with you yet. After this crisis, He will use you more. I'll say that again. God is not done with you yet. God is not finished with you yet. After this crisis, after your crisis, He will use you in fact, I believe He is here. Your Messiah, your Mashiach is here. Right here, right now, right wherever you are. So in this moment, may I encourage you, surrender to your Savior. Surrender to your Savior. Give yourself to the Mashiach in the same way He gave Himself to you on the cross. Amen. Amen.